everyone. It's Peter Kerr from Rock Day Dream Nation, and I've got Davey Gallagher back to the channel. How are you, Davey? Good, thanks, Peter. How are you this fine evening slash Sun morning? Sunday evening. No, going well, going well. We're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to talk about movie soundtracks and a particular band that seemed to be very much in the horror genre or the horror thriller genre of the 70s and 80s. And I'm talking about the band Goblin. So that's one of their record store day releases. Many iconic horror films like Suspiria, Dawn of the Dead, Tenebrae, good to get you onto the channel. We can have a little bit of a chat about our favourite Goblin scores, uh, discuss the impact uh, and influence they had on the genre and maybe beyond the genre of horror and thriller. And, um, yeah, just take it from there. So I'll throw it over to you, Davey. What was your first encounter with Goblin, the first maybe movie or score that you sort of, you know, noticed Goblin per se? Uh, it would have been Dawn of the Dead rather predictably, um, especially someone who's on the monstrous den, say, Tranquility. Um, but especially because in the European cut, where Danny Orgento re-edited the film, he boosted their music in the mix. So the Goblin score in the American version is there, but in the Italian version, European version, it is <clears throat> right in your face um, so that definitely would have been my first exposure and you can't really miss from there um, they're very distinctive so obviously Dawn of the Dead's got a lot of library music in it as well to kind of pad it out so, but you can hear the, the different parts you know exactly what bits are goblin what bits are, are uh, library music stock music um, but yeah that would have been my first what about you? Yeah for me Suspiria um an amazing movie, probably my favourite Dario Argento movie of all time, and I think you may be talking about it. There it is. An absolute stunning soundtrack, and it has its own sort of dimension and personality, which I'm sure you'll talk about, but that really got my attention. Look, I, like, I think like any 13, 14 impressionable teenage in the VHS era, it was a common rite of passage uh, to watch horror movies. You know, you would encounter Dario Argento, you would encounter Lucio Fulci, you would encounter all these Mad Max ripoffs. I love those Italian movies, unavoidable that you um, you wouldn't, you know, hear a Goblin score or a Goblin adjacent score because they were so influential. There are a lot of composers like Fabio Frizzi, etc., that sort of took what Goblin set down in Suspiria and took it to that extra dimension. So, And even um, one of their great influences, Keith Emerson, Emerson Lake and Palmer, would himself go on to score a Daddy Orgento film. Yes. You know, which, yeah, so so odds, you know, the way that music can be circular with that, that they, they, um, he influences them in ELP and then they influence him in terms of his film score work they hadn't done beforehand. Ab absolutely. Uh, they, course, and they were influenced in turn by, I mean, you can hear it in their music, Pink Floyd, of course, but Pink Floyd had already scored music to uh, mm. you know, uh, Body and, and more, uh, a couple of films from the late 60s, early 70s, a little mm. bit as a brisky point. But it was quite unusual um, for bands to score movies. It was it was always the composer who would come up with, here's what you're going to play, guys, and get people in, be it a band or be it a full orchestra, as we know. And then on Profondo Rosso, which was Dario Argento's kind of break away from working with Ennio Morricone after the Animal Trilogy in the early 70s, he got a composer in. And they didn't go on well at all. And that Argento turned kind of desperately to this band, Cherry Five, who were the goblin in all but name. And, and when you watch this video to this day, it still is credited to the goblin rather than goblin. Because it, yes. it was almost more of a studio project than, a, yep. than a, a band as we know it, with very fluid lineups. Pretty steady for their kind of most classic period. 
But then after about 78, very fluid, everybody in and out, even Claudio Simonetti. Everybody in and out. Yeah, just who was available who was available at that point. There's yeah. a, a lot of different fringe groups and spin-offs. I've seen two or three of them live, including Claudio Simonetti's Goblin. Um, but yeah, the, the kind of main classic um, era of Goblin, if you want from Profondo Rosso through the later 70s, is um, Agostino Marangalo on drums, uh, Massimo Morante on the guitars. I mean, they all, they all play about 300 instruments, but this is the kind of bass version. And speaking of bass, that's where Fabio comes in. Fabio. Oh, uh, he's, his bass really just pops out in a lot of the, a lot of the scores. Yeah, he's such a fluid player, such a distinctive Absolutely. player. Absolutely. And but, then Simonetti himself, obviously, is the, the keyboard guy. Um, plays yeah. 300 instruments. A but, lot of Mellotron stuff, um, mm. obviously, throughout the band. But taking back to the olden days, uh, mm. a horror, a typical horror score would be like maybe a Bernard Herrmann, um, the staccato shock strings of Psycho, etc. So... This sort of electronica, you know, the use of Moog synthesizers, the use of percussion, um, rock instruments was quite different and it was quite progressive and um, very influential in respect of modern thriller and horror. Um, and, you know, we were just talking offline about another band that we hold dear to our heart, Tangerine Dream. I'm not sure if... Andrew and Dream was influenced by Goblin or vice versa, but maybe they were parallel, but working in a, in a very similar um, pathway, um, you know, doing very electronic propulsive music, which you could say that is like a, an extra personality to the movie. Whatever's happening on the screen, it was like an extra character was the, um, the score of the film. Yeah, you're 100% right. Where, whereas in some films the soundtrack is telling you what to think and what to feel it's kind of holding your hand goblin soundtracks often not always but often they make the film almost in your mind even when you're just listening to them as music taking away the pictures so you know i would use the example of tubular bells people think that's the scary album because it was in the exorcist 95% of that album is not even remotely like that section that's in the Exorcist. But when you listen to a Goblin album, there's a good chance that you will feel, oh, that's quite easy, that's quite spooky. Or later in their career, they start to move into a much more jazzy feel, and they yes. kind of master that too. They're such a, a fluid band. Again, with members kind of rotating in and out, maybe they've oh, we're going to do something a bit more jazzy. Let's get, you know, they have a sax in for Suspiria, for example, um, even though that's not a very jazzy soundtrack. But um, certainly in their uh, crime film work that I'll talk about as well, they do go a bit more world music, if you like. Not, not overtly, but certainly they, they put a goblin spin on things. But yeah, you're right. They make the, the music a character unto itself. It's not just separate from the film. Yeah. Well, I'm fully adrenalised in this chat. I think we, let's talk about Suspiria because um, yeah. it's one of my favourite um, Dario Argento movies and it's, it's, it's groundbreaking, really. And um, I actually recently caught the remake as well. So I might have a, a quick word about that because that's got an iconic soundtrack um, Yeah, yeah, and a very different take. But... Um, yeah, let, let's let's have a chat about Suspiria. What, what do you think of that soundtrack in the Goblin discography? So Suspiria has probably their most famous bit of music, even, which is the title track itself that opens up the film and indeed the, the soundtrack itself. Um, it's even the title track, so they're pretty much telling you this is what you should be concentrating on. Um, and it's got that gorgeous 13-note, Celeste are playing from, from Claudio Simon, uh, Simonetti. And the, the Celeste kind of uh, xylophone and the piano almost um, could be used nominally to imply something is a bit more fairy tale. Think of the, the Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy by Tchaikovsky from Swan Lake, that kind of thing. 
but it can also be used like it's used in the title track here to give a very eerie melody with the mm. do, 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 and which just dinks along, dinks along, and then it's the addition of the the really intense tambla drum that boom, just brings it crashing down and tells you don't get comfortable here because this film is going to take you, you know, when you think something, boom. Don't don't settle down for for a second. And interestingly, it's um it's Fabio, the bass player, who's playing the tabla drum. It's not the it's not the mm. drummer, which is it's odd in some ways, but then it's not a very rhythmic use in it. It's very kind of staccato, just play it every ten seconds kind of thing. Um, it's stunning stuff. And then the track kicks into a real space rock middle part, um, which just is intense. Um, and it shows their influences. Um, you can hear Yes in it. You can hear ELP in it, definitely. But yeah, you can hear Yes, I think, distinctively. And that was who they originally were um, kind of trying to be in their very baby band days um, with a slightly different lineup when they went to London to try and get a deal. Yes was the kind of idols um but you can hear yes in that that time structure change and the intensity change and the way that they can make beauty and darkness combine into one and nowhere better than that title track from suspedia which is iconic unto itself I think it's like a mu I, I know you said xylophone, but it's like a, an evil music box. You know, the ones where a kid opens it oh, up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Little... yeah. It's, it's no. stunning. Um, you know the most memorable scene in that movie that I know uh, when I first saw that, and I know this is, this is something evil and really eerie, was when they go to the airport and there's nobody around. And mm -hmm. there's storm and it's just this rain... And, you know, basically the lead actress comes in, Je Jessica Harper, and it's just so eerie, even before she gets into, goes to the, the dance school. But that, that, that sets the scene, and the music is in perfect um, synergy with, with that yeah. particular scene, you know. It just, it's, it's just like a feeling of dread that, you know, I don't belong here and get, get the hell out, you know what I mean? Yeah, and it adds to it because we've obviously got, I mean, Dario Argento has made the Animal Trilogy by this point, Bird, the Crystal Plumage, etc., cetera, um, which, great stuff. Um, love all three of those films. But this is where he starts to assert himself, most obviously as a director, where he's borrowing from another great maestro, Mario Bava, um, in terms of colour. So for this whole film, there's incredibly distinctive colour schemes. So when Susie Banyan, yeah, when Susie Banyan, uh, Jessica Harper's character, is coming to the, the ballet school in the taxi at the start, there's ridiculous lighting hitting her. And at the start, you think maybe it's just because she's in the town and it's just the shops, you know, the colour from the shops, green here, purple here. Um, but then when she's in the forest driving towards the school, there's still green and there's still red and purples hitting her face. Just to kind of throw you off kilter, the, this is a very stylized world. Of course we know that's going to be Dario Argento's trademark. It kind of starts in the Animal Trilogy, but it really gets established here. And it's going to be his trademark in his most famous works of the later 70s into the 80s. Um, and you get you know tracks like Witch, um, with the distorted drums and the Mellotron, uh, Mellotron uh, vocalization, which they use quite a lot, where they want the Mellotron to almost sound like vocals. Um, there are a few vocals on here. Quite often they, they find ways to make the Mellotron sound like vocals, but there are a few dubbed on as well to make more eerie noises, kind of uh, sighs and wails and things. Yeah, yeah, which, which noises and... and, and and various yeah. things like that. Have you just seen the movie on the big screen or only in video? Yeah, I've seen most of the big Argentos on the big screen. I've never had the opportunity. Apparently the soundtrack is just startling and it's really loud. Yeah, no, but, know, the, the percussion is like startling. 
you have also seen Claudio Simonetti's Goblin playing the soundtrack live. Wow. Um, and Claudio Simonetti's Goblin were really a repurposed version of his spin-off band, um, Demonia. Um, so he takes a couple of members of Demonia and does his own Splinter Goblin. There were three goblins at one point. I managed mm. to see two of them, and the other one didn't tour. Um, but they, Claudio's one did the, the soundtrack stuff more and didn't worry too much about new music, although they have made some great new music as well since then. Um, and they played a very metallic version of the soundtrack, which was quite interesting, very different aesthetic to Claudio's. Did that, did that work, you think? Not entirely for for a listening experience, but for a live experience, it certainly works. It's one of those things that you think, I'm really glad that I've seen this at a concert. I'm not sure that I'd ever want this to be the soundtrack to the record. Yeah. It's one of those. Um, and then you've got a wonderful um, scene in there where she meets everybody and you just start to get the uncanny feel from there even where she meets Ada Valley's character. Um, an actress that I've loved. Um, she's in great horror films, like the, uh, the House That Screams, but she goes right back to the third man with Orson Welles mm. and whatnot. Um, and she's the, the kind of strict mistress of the house, and she's always got that weird smile on her face that's pretty terrifying. Yes, yes, Frozen yes, you're on. right. Um, and she meets, obviously, um, uh, Madame Blanc, who runs the place, and she's, you know, the actress was getting on about Joan Bennett, the um, Hollywood star in the 40s, but she's not great. She's She was already uh, suffering cognitive decline in the late 60s doing Dark Shadows, the TV show. Mm. So you can kind of hear it in her performance where she's not quite sure how to pitch things. But it does get covered up well. Um, it, she doesn't let the film down or anything. It does get covered yeah. up pretty and everything around them is so bizarre as well. You know, the odd butler, uh, the weird woman who looks after the the nephew of, of uh, uh, Madame Blanc. Uh, even the fact that Susie, when she first goes to the school, gets refused entry, and then one girl runs out kind of in desolation, wanting to escape from the place. You know, it kind of sets the scene perfect from there. But you've got to admit, it's one of the most heavily percussive Goblin soundtracks mm. out of their whole um, yeah. sort of disc- discography. It's so stark in in that sense, and I think as a film, Argento has lapses of common sense, which you have to, you know, he's taking a leap of belief. But in this movie, you you sort of, I think it's the most logical thriller comparative to his uh, other th- films like Tenebrae, where there's gaps in, you know, sort of logic that you have to accept, it, it becomes a little bit more surreal. Would you say this is his most logical movie? Um, not his most logical. I mean, it, it, I'd say that the very early stuff has to be that because they're more crime thrillers as well. Hot boilers, so yeah, of, yeah. Yeah, so they have to kind of tie A to B to C. Um, mm. to give you a resolution at the end. But in terms of his, his more horror-oriented oeuvre, so say from Profondo Rosso, Deep Red onwards, probably. Um, I'd, mm. I'd say it's certainly the even if you don't understand every bit, you have enough information to extrapolate something to feel. Um, and he calls it dream logic, what he does in his films, um, which some people do think is just a lazy excuse for not writing. And sometimes that is the truth, actually. Some of his later work although he has still got some great films later in his career. Stentall Syndrome, Sleepless. Um, but he did have a big lull, you know, and he's made some awful, awful films where, yeah, there are just j- jumps that aren't that aren't dream logic. They are just laziness and probably bad editing. And, and yeah, it just completely doesn't right, make sense. And you were right about the percussive nature of the soundtrack. And what I love about it is it's not just percussion in terms of Oh, well, there's lots of drums on it. It's percussive in every way possible, where um, there are tracks like um, Size, which is the track that's playing when Susie goes to town to stay in the the apartment of her friend, not short-term friend, um, who then she gets booted out from, has to stay 
with the girls' school. So that, that plays over that section, which is going to and from there. And that uses a percussive chant-like vocal, an almost Tibetan monk-style vocal mm. underpinning everything. In the same way that, and it always sounds kind of eerie that when you hear it, 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 it like uh, the Yardbirds track, Still I'm Sad, you know, that, that kind of thing. Um, but they're using it very percussively, but it's home. Mm. But, um, Peter Gabriel would use it kind of in Biko for, you know, another example. He would he would throw in little bits of that, you know, under his breath, you know, going home. Um, but they use it in a much larger way here, and it sounds quite menacing, daunting. You know, don't go back, Susie. You know, it's only going to be worse if you go back there, kind of. Yeah, and the surround yeah. sound when you hear the whispering, mm-hmm. you know, it's sort of like, um, like uh, some of the uh, the later versions. Uh, I mean, mm-hmm. I think this originally came out on Anchor Bay. I bought the the first edition when it came out. Are you mm-hmm. looking for it? <laughs> um, no, I'm just. I'm wondering who's got it now, and, and the UK yeah. said. And um, I, I had the first version of it, and in surround sound, just in, you know, on, just sounded fantastic. You know, you'd hear voices coming out of one speaker and the other, and yeah. oh man, to see it on the big screen, that that sort of experience would have just been fantastic. Um, yeah, as I said, it's almost- an it's an it's an extra character to the film. Yeah. And almost literally, I mean, one of the tracks is just called Marcos, which is uh, the name of the the head witch who we don't mm. see until the end of the film. Um, and that's that uses different instrumentation entirely. We just got a big fat synth sound from from Claudio with a lot of staccato stuff on top being played. Mm. So it's got a very beefy sound at the bass. And then when you go higher, a very staccato sound. So it's kind of contrasting, playing around, throwing you off. And as you say, especially with surrounds, that that works so well. Where you feel one thing and you've been thrown the other way at the same time. You're, you never want to rest in your laurels. And this film kind of tells you that. And you yeah. do have tracks on there that kind of hint at what they're going to do later, like Black Forest, um, which is a little bit more of a a jazzy style to it um, and really shows some of Fabio's more fluid playing. Um, he's such a great bass player. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, his, his yeah. stuff there is phenomenal. And it, yeah. it's not, um, there's there's a lot of guitar on the records, but a lot of it's used in complement of other instrumentation. It's not the most Massimo Morante album. So anyone who wants guitar god Massimo Morante, um, who idolised Blackmore and Tommy Iommi, you're not really going to get that from this score in particular. There are no. other scores, but I'm talking about a track that really soars on in the next film, um, but it's not really one, one of his. Yeah. Guitar this is a, a very a specific. Head. Yeah, I yeah. think uh, Argento had a particular vision and the band worked on that, that particular vision. And, and that's and... the great thing about Goblin. They put egos mm. aside. Mostly until the breakup, yeah. and they don't. But yeah, mostly. yeah. And uh, let's face it, it's like a Grimm's fairy tale, but um, a very horrific Grimm's fairy tale. And a lot of European sort of uh, fairy tales are, are based in horror. And uh, I just think this is sort of like a modern retelling of that. And um, I think they've just created a, a beautiful landscape, um, soundscape, so to speak, that matches so the, before, the vision of Argento. About, before we talk about um, you know, one of the films that you've picked to kind of look at. What did you think of the remake? Because I loved it. It stretches it out. There, there's oddness, but it, it takes its time and it's never boring. It's languid, yeah. but um, I liked it. I liked it a lot, but it, it's, it's, it's disturbing in its own way. Um, yeah. Suspiria is very much more compact and mm-hmm. it, it, it runs at a very fast pace. But this one um, is like double the length, but it's never boring, but it's got its own weirdness. And, um, oh, I, I love the, uh, the, you know, the soundtrack. I, I just think that's, that's wonderful as well. But it's By a Tom York. I mean, we're talking, we're it's not a remake. Regret. It's a completely different movie. Yeah, it is. Um, and it's, it's a response, if anything, because it takes into account Suspiria did these things. 
So we can't do them better. So let's do them differently. So the colour scheme is so much a massive character in Suspiria. She goes into her room and everything in it is pink. Even people walked into the room with a blue dress, if they walk in, it's suddenly pink. Dream logic again. But in the new one, it's very muted tones, very earth tones, right throughout the film. Right throughout it. I had a bit of a Lars von Trier feel about this movie. Um, I don't know. I, I think that it's 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 kind of a, a very modern European feel to it. I don't know. Did you get a feel that uh, Lars von Trier, a little bit of influence there? Yeah, I mean, maybe in terms of the expansive nature of it. Um, I mean, you could easily see Tilda Swinton, you know, working, because it's very grounded as well, strangely, mm. even though she plays the ancient witch, and she plays an old man in it, for goodness sake. It should come off as kind of silly, but it, yeah, it comes across as much more of an uh, an artistic endeavour, um, where you really get the feel that it attempts to find out what made Suspiria great. Let's take the, the genesis of that, but then let's do something different with it, while always remembering we can't copy Suspiria. So nothing on Tom York's soundtrack sounds like Goblin, and nothing in the film looks like Daddy Argento, mm. but it retains the spirit, if not any of the, any of the actual uh, kind of most obvious things to, to crib, like 99% of remakes would. It's not, as you say, it's not a remake. It's something that takes the same idea and makes a new film from it. Absolutely. But Dario didn't well, groove on it. Dario didn't groove on it. He, he, well, he made Dracula 3D in 2012, so I'm not too bothered by that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, Daddy was Daddy has been very hit and miss for decades, so tough. Um, I'm always what, I'm waiting for the comeback, but um, yeah. I don't know if it's going to happen, mate. So. He had um, um, Dark Glasses two years ago, which was uh, his best film in 25 years. Um, um, just at his age, making foreign language films, they don't cross over in the way that they used to. Mm. I just don't think it could happen now. Yeah. Although he has acted recently, which is quite... He started taking up a little bit of acting. Yeah. What, what was one of the films that you'd like to really spot? Um, Dawn, let's talk about Dawn of the Dead and feel free. Mm. So this is the most, I think, one of the more mainstream Goblin soundtracks where they're really stretching their musical chops into a lot of different genres. So you've got the main theme, which is Dawn of the Dead, and you've got that funeral paced heartbeat rhythm, the analog yeah. keyboard, you've got the timpanis, the bass. Um, it's an iconic haunting sort of theme that runs throughout the whole film. When you look at the tracks, and I'm basing it on the uh, Dawn of the Dead or Zombie, which they called it, which is more very heavily goblin. You know, there's there's country and western, there's honky tonk. They are very much um, adapting the store the score for the various scenes through the film. So there's there's some light hearted parts of it. There's uh, uh, the hunt, which is you know where they're going shooting the the various zombies. Uh, you know, everyone's shooting for sport. Uh, it's got a playful feel about it. Um, it. It really conveys the dark gallows humour of Dawn of the Dead because Dawn of the Dead, I've always, it's a horror movie, but I can I can look at this movie and think of it as a thriller and also I can look at it on another level as social commentary. So it's a wonderful movie. It's a bit of a masterpiece because you can look at it at three levels, horror, thriller, social commentary. And yeah. um, there's not that many horror films that, uh, that rich that you could sort of look at it in three levels. Yeah, and it's, it's an interesting fact trap because to me, they develop the ideas that you can already hear in Suspiria and Deep Red, Profondo Rosso. You can, you can hear what they were going for there. So there's, they bring back the timpani, they bring back Mellotron making vocals, um, and they bring back pounding synths. Um, fluid bass, um, crunching guitar at points, but guitar often used very sparingly once again. Um, percussive stuff to, especially where there's something fast paced going on, which you know, it's quite standard, you know, because you're literally setting the march pace almost with the percussive. 
Um, but it, it, again, it shows that they are very sympathetic to the film itself. Although interestingly, they weren't scoring George Romero's film; they were doing it more as a "we're working with Dario" kind of deal. Yeah, um, and George Romero liked it, um, but he did like a lot more library music. There wasn't a lot of money to get who George Romero wanted in at the time and, or get a you know, real composer, to use a term. But, um, George wanted to have songs in it at one point. There wasn't enough money to license any kind of real songs. So Goblin, they don't, they never slum it, which is something we'll come to with my next kind of film choice. They never slum it. So you never get the sense that they're thinking, this is an American film. It's, you know, it's not our wheelhouse. We'll just kind of we'll just kind of do what we've done before and kind of pad this one out. They still work to their to their full abilities, coming up with something that responds to every scene. So when you see Flyboy having to run from from one of the hordes, or when you see the bikers turning up in the mall, completely different score from what you've heard five seconds ago. And it's not unusual for soundtracks to flip on a dime. But what is kind of unusual is for a band to be able to master every kind of mini genre that they, they visit in that soundtrack, mm. which Goblin do. And again, it comes from being such a prolific group of session players that they can just think, what would work for this this moment? Not even this scene, this moment. What does it need right this second, literally? And almost frame by frame, they, they kind of work along with the, the film from from getting a little bit more playful where they're, you know, they think they're safe in the mall and they start going around and looking through the shops and things. And and you're right in the film as well, of course, about being three different levels. Um, it, it is social commentary. I don't think it's George's most insightful social commentary. I mean, it's just it's set in the mall and people like malls and we're all consumers. Um, he... he Tried to do another social commentary zombie film in 2005, uh, Land of the Dead, which was absolutely abysmal. Um, but I didn't that mind that. I, I don't think it was bottom of the, the bottom of the barrel. Um, I think no, it's that much it, worse. You still had you still had yeah. two films left to go to scrape that barrel. Yeah, um, but there's a reason why we talk about the the Dead trilogy and not the Dead Sex Tet. Put it that way. Mm. Um, but yeah, the zombie soundtrack for that is iconic too. I don't think it's their best, though. I really think that they've got much more interesting things outside of Dawn of the Dead. It's just the most famous because that film was the biggest of the, of the lot. That Absolutely, and therefore it's the most mainstream. But you're, you're, you're dead right. What I want to, I definitely want to highlight that they can do action scenes like no other, um, and mm-hmm. they're up there like with Lalo Schifrin. Um, there's an action scene, I think it's called Zombie, and it's it's got percussion, it's got this sampled choir, uh, staccato guitar, and that wonderful languid bass, and with the keyboard stabs. Um, yeah. One thing I've got to talk to our viewers is a lot of these soundtracks are eminently listenable as a standalone without watching the movie. I was actually on a plane ride and I downloaded on um, Spotify all these Goblin soundtracks and it was just a wonderful listen across the Pacific from America. They're wonderful as as standalone. They're really interesting because there are soundtracks that you've got to have some sort of relationship with the movie and have, you know, need to see the movie to understand. But these um, soundtracks are are like standalone wonderful. Um, Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah, and since you asked me to, to do the show um, last month, um, which I always appreciate because it gives you time to really go and revisit rather than just do a quick skim and then yeah. have to do the stuff. So I've been listening to them a lot for the last month. And you're right, just walking around, the soundtracks work. Don't get me wrong, some of it makes you want to stand still and, and run home. Um, but... <laughs> But it works as music. And sometimes I've watched a film and thought, what a brilliant soundtrack, bought the soundtrack, and then played it and went, eh, it doesn't work as well without the visuals. Mm. Um, it is a good soundtrack because that's its job, but it's not a good album. Whereas Goblin's scores, almost unanimously, 
are good albums as well as good soundtracks to the films. Yeah. And I think Dawn of the Dead does, or Zombie works on that level mm. as um, a good sta standalone soundtrack because uh, there's so much variety. They're doing a lot of cross genre within that soundtrack. And yeah, I, I think it works. But, and it's um, interesting that Zombie cuts out a lot of the library music, but it keeps the gonk because everybody loves that track. You know, that. Da -da 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 oh, absolutely. Um, you um, can't get rid of that. Yeah, I believe, is, isn't there a little bit of trivia that's the shortest uh, top 40 song ever to hit the UK charts? That actually charted that song. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if it still is because I'd imagine, you know, things are now eligible for the charts just based on downloads. So I'm sure some album track from Ed Sheeran might have been in there somewhere now ruining everything, like most Ed Sheeran things. Um, but, yeah, maybe. I know Telly Savalas did. As was the shortest uh, yeah. or F thought it was the top uh, the first number one with the two letters but I don't know the length one yeah um, before I go to your choice with Dawn of the Dead um, I know it's a very popular movie in your circles with the Monsters Den and, and Sea of Tranquility there's so many versions um, and I was just perusing YouTube and there's this ultimate ultimate version which seems to be a hodgepodge of um, every single version put together, and it goes for almost three hours. Uh, what's your view of the ultimate, ultimate version? I assume you have seen it. Yeah, I've, I've got the uh, 4K box set from Second Sight that has mm. everything and the Goblin soundtrack and the library music in its entirety. Mm. Um, to me, Romero's cut is the best. It's George Romero. Um, he knows how to be an economical filmmaker. Zombie, if you want to hear Goblin, is the best way to view it. Romero's works best as a film, I think. Um, but, yeah, I'm not a big fan of these just throw everything in and call it the ultimate cut. Uh, yeah. Kind of ideas of it. I, think, I think it's already quite a fatty film. It's my least favourite of the, the trilogy, if you like. Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead. Um, I love Day of the Dead. I think it's a masterpiece. Um, I think Night of the Living Dead's a masterpiece. And I think Dawn of the Dead's great. I just don't think it's a masterpiece. Yeah, I've got a theory about horror films. I think it shouldn't go any longer than two hours. Um, comedy and yeah. horror should be between 90 and 120 minutes. I think if it goes over 120 minutes, it gets a bit fatty. Yeah, I mean, it, obviously, it depends on, you know, is there a great writer? Is there a great director? Mm. Um, then you can you can keep it going. Um, but yeah, there's the old rule of thumb is you've got ninety minutes that will give you anything after that you have to earn. Yeah, it's a little bit pat, a little bit of padding. All right, what's your next one? Um, so we didn't want to just go and do all the the main kind of. You know, just watch the three most popular albums, four most popular albums. Mm. So I picked a film that's one of the more obscure soundtracks, um, but it's The Heroin Busters, um, directed by Enzo G. Castellari, who did you know, um, the original and Glorious Bastards and like, stars the great Fabio Testi, stars David Hemmings um, from Deep Red, but he'll always be. Uh, the Unman Whittening and Zygo for me is one of his masterpiece uh, performances. Um, Street Law was another Castelletti film. So it's a, a political techie, an Italian crime film of the 70s. Probably their most, their most uh, prolific genre. When people, film fans tend to think of Italian film, they think of spaghetti western and they think of horror. But actually they made a lot more crime films, political techie, um, than anything else. Because obviously it's easier to do. You don't need special effects. You don't need um, you don't need a lot of... Uh, you don't need to go to Spain to do a spaghetti west and that kind of thing. So they, they did a lot of these, these crime films in the 70s, usually getting in an actor from outside, just like the spaghetti westerns, to give it some value maybe in America or um, in the UK, in this case, David Hemmings. Um, and it's a great film. This is a story of... Two cops, really one cop, Fabio Testi's character, who is undercover in a drug syndicate 
and the syndicate are worldwide and they're trying to bring down the Italian operation, if you will. So it's the Italian job, pardon the pun. Um, but the reason I picked it is because, first of all, I think it's got some great music in it, but it's one of the more diverse soundtracks, I think, um, where... Yeah, there's there's a lot of things in Suspiria and there's a lot of things in Dawn of the Dead that are absolutely great, but maybe not the most diverse. So Suspiria, every track is pretty creepy. Yeah. Um, it, it sets something of a tone. You could put the Suspiria soundtrack on for a really scary Halloween party, for example, and no one track would take you out. Um, but this... Nothing on here stays generic crime soundtrack. So when you think of friends, like you said, Lalo Schaffron's there for the Dirty Harry, probably is his most famous soundtrack of the, of the time, but it made a million. Um, but this doesn't sound like that at all, even though it's as good a crime film, I think, as maybe the first Dirty Harry, certainly as good as Magnum Force, or certainly better than the three after that. But it's actually got a lot of Herbie Hancock in here, which you don't hear in Suspiria at all. And you don't hear in uh, Dawn of the Dead. But by wah, wah, point, wah, wah guitar, a lot of wah, wah guitar. Yeah. Well, a lot of Headhunters in particular. Okay. In this. Um, annoyingly, the, the tracks don't have names. They're called Sequence 1, Sequence 2, Sequence 3. Um, so sequence one, for example, is the main titles. And I mentioned um, that Morante's guitar doesn't let him be the guitar hero that perhaps some would like. On this track, it absolutely does. So the, the main titles of this, the Heroin Busters theme tune, people check that out and you just hear this brilliant sustained guitar from, from Morante throughout, a brilliant solo in the middle. And you can hear throughout this record his love for Robert Fripp's kind of playing that he's developed by this point. Where earlier on, he's still very, very playing either in the background, playing some lovely acoustic stuff and playing all sorts of instruments as well, bazookies and things. Um, but generally speaking, sticking to uh, 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 when he gets to solo in some of the films, you can hear that it is very Iomi, very Blackmore, more of a, a classic rock aesthetic. In this, you can start to hear really progressive sounds coming through, which I absolutely love to hear. Um, and then sequence two, and the reason, again, I picked this is because the opening of the film takes you around the syndicate, around the whole globe, to show you, just for this opening sequence, all the different operations. And when we cut to a different part of the world, each of them is scored completely differently. So when we start, we've got this great rock playing with a lot of progressive elements from Morante on guitar. But then in sequence two, I hate the names, why didn't they just give them titles? In sequence two, we're in Hong Kong. So you, stereotypically, we start to do a little bit of Asian sounding things on soundtracks when we go to Asia. You know, it's just, here we are in Hong Kong, we better get the da -da 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 -da. They don't do any of that. What they do, though, is give you some uh, Mellotron, from Claudio, um, which uses a lot of vocals behind it and kind of pushes them up in the mix to again give you a kind of uncanny feel that something dodgy is happening here, something bad. And it's not bad because it's witches like this video. It's bad because our main character here, well, he's a bad guy, and I can tell this. He's dressed up. He's a, he's a drug dealer. He's actually an undercover cop. We learn that very fast. It's to throw you off the scent. We think we're watching a drug peddler go through all these scenes. We're actually watching an undercover cop, which we don't learn until the credits finish. Um, but then that goes into the next sequence, sequence three, which is in South America. Um, and we're seeing, we're seeing um, an, a, a kind of drug cartel lord enjoying the, the beach kind of thing, just out in the sun. And that adds marimba and goblin are doing this lazy poolside stuff but it still works so impossible well it's so cool but it's again so different you wouldn't have had this jazzy laid back uh, goblin anywhere near the last couple of zen tracks we talked about but again because they're such studio masters they get it sequence five 
gives you the most goblin goblin of this album um, because there's very eerie synths. It's a little bit dated in some of the uh, Claudio White that had the effects on top, which have dated quite badly. Frank Zappa did that a lot where, uh, where he went back and redubbed some of his stuff and added effects on top. And I don't, It's never dated well, that kind of thing. Um, but you get plodding drum work intentionally to kind of set the scene and slow it down a little bit. Nimble acoustic guitar, and a lot of a lot of Goblin's guitar, as good as he is as a as a, a lead player, Morante, he's also an extremely wonderful acoustic player. Um, and then it turns into a very harsh and kind of violent stabbing sounds on percussion throughout, which again works so well on a crime film because you know we're setting that scene of brutal violence, bludgeoning. Um, turn the wrong street, you're going to get shot, you're going to get stabbed. So, yeah, I mean, it's later on it goes into kind of disco synths, which is something that, that Claudio would experiment with a lot, um, kind of almost a forebear of where Giorgio Moroder soundtracks would go um, in, in the late 70s, early 80s. But, yeah, just a, a wonderful, wonderful score that ties so well to the film, like you were saying, they're very conscious of what's happening on the screen. So there's a scene where uh, a junkie is being slapped around and every time the slap happens, we just get very subtle <clears throat> on the on the snare, just to let you know that's a slap. Again, it's a very low-budget Italian crime film that they've put this much care into to really worry about Okay, that's the bit where he's getting slapped. We should do something with that guy, you know. They're, um, they never slum it. Is the movie? If the movie didn't have the soundtrack, would the movie be average? Is the soundtrack better than the movie? Does it lift it? No, but I love en- Enzo Castelletti as the director. Again, when he's good, because as we know, yeah, a lot of these guys, um, when the budgets disappear and when time when times change and tastes change, yeah. you said. Fulci ended up having to just do Mad Max rip-offs and whatnot. Yeah, um, not not the best ending for some of their careers where they have to just take whatever's offered. But mm. this is an exciting French connection-like thriller. Right. Which has got a chase sequence that lasts for half an hour, but only the French connection where he's in the car for all that. He's not in it for half an hour in the French connection, but... When Gene Hackman's got that iconic uh, car chase in the French connection with the subway overhead. Mm-hmm. And this Fabio Testi is chased on foot and then in bikes and then in cars and then planes. But it never goes ridiculous. It's all very grounded and organic. And it feels like a ramp up. And again, Gobbler ramping up the music to go along with the... How the hell are they going to top this? We've just seen the... You know, this massive bike stunt. Um, and the, yeah, well, yeah. well, okay, bring in the airplanes. Uh, and their music takes off with the airplanes. So again, they're just, they know exactly what to add to complement what's, what's, excuse me, what's happening at every point during the film. And again, they're never slumming it just because, well, this one won't be big in America or the UK. Let's not bother with it's it. It's a genre <laughs> film and it won't be yeah. big. Because let's face it, a lot of these movies were just in the 42nd Street um grind houses it all the drive-in circuit they didn't really um get that sort of main release so yeah, um yeah because they did they did comedies and things you know the, the gang that sold america she was never mm. a big film um they did things for uh, joe damato who had absolutely no money to work with whatsoever um they did um St. Helens, which was a, an HBO American spin off uh, television film thing. They did um, uh, the Australian film, didn't they? Um, Patrick. Patrick. Patrick, yeah. yes. Um, Richard Franklin's Patrick. Great movie. Yes. Um, and they did, they did the soundtrack to that. And all of these were in a couple of years of each other, too. That's the other remarkable thing because they're not a live band at this point. This all happens within just a few years. Yeah. Everything was so- talked about. It. They're like an entity, so they weren't like a, a a band as such. Where there's you know John Paul George and Ringo, they're like a maybe it's like a brand. It's like a, you know a, a revolving players. I mean, as you said in the the classic era with Suspiria, you, you had these 
corp people, but when it came into the 80s, it, um, it sort of was a revolving yeah. door of uh, different uh, musicians, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, pretty much everybody leaves and comes back at some point. Um, even as late as 2009, I want to say, is the last time they played together, yeah. the original lineup. Um, but again, Maranti's he's, dead, isn't he? Maranti died. Died, so. died two years ago. Yeah, um, so he was a foundation. Um, Simonetti yeah. is a he yeah. was he's still around in some sort of incarnation. Yeah, because that's how I've seen, and he left. He's left a couple of times. Yeah, it's one of those. It's one of those bands a bit like Deep Purple, where you need to you need to get your head around the lineups. Just you know, but there's no there's no way you could do this in terms of Mark One, Mark Two, because sometimes the get yeah. the lineup changes just for just for this one session and then it changes back again and then yep. it may change again for the next session. So guys get added as additional musician, even though the best part of the movie is they're playing perhaps. Mm. But after a film that I think you're going to talk about is when that starts to happen, where everybody starts to get offered individual work because the work had been so popular and the soundtracks had sold really well yeah. in the most part that they all get offered individual solo deals, but not solo deals to make music, solo deals to make soundtracks, which is quite an unusual thing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that's a, probably a little segue into my movie. The movie I'm going to spotlight is Contamination, and I think it's known as different names, Alien Contamination. Depends what region of the world. Very much a drive-in type of movie. Um, I think... I think the first time I encountered this, it was on a double bill in a drive-in with without warning. Um, look that up, folks. Um, the director was Lugio uh, Cosi, who is, uh, he did The Delightful Star Crash. That's a bit of fun, yeah. bit of a B movie. Also did Hercules. This is strictly an alien ripoff. Well, it starts off where this boat, um, you know, this abandoned boat enters uh, New York, and that, that's happened a few times. I think uh, Zombie Flesh Eaters or Zombie, the Lucio yeah. Fulci, had a, a similar sort of plot line. Everything seems to enter into New York. Got these alien cyclops on this boat, and there's a, a plot or conspiracy where they want to use uh, these aliens from Mars, want to use human agents to plant and place eggs all over the Earth and uh, take over the... Um, over the planet so it's a it's a wacky movie it's strictly b movie but the soundtrack is definitely you've got a gold-plated soundtrack over um, a pretty schlocky movie so davy this is an example of where the, the the soundtrack is so much so superior to the the material um which is in contrast to the movies that you've probably highlighted yeah i mean i, I like um, contamination quite a bit um, g generally though because uh, I mean I, I, I like Ian McCulloch a lot who's the star of the film um, he made a lot of genre films in Italy at the time um, and he's from Glasgow um, so I've got a lot of time for Ian McCulloch um, he's very in, solid isn't he yeah and he's, he's just like Richard Johnson one of those guys who was in so many of these films because he was solid because he was cheap but because he was good yeah um, and not ashamed of them at all. He was in a great BBC show called Survivors. I don't know if that made its way to Australia. Um, a bit post-apocalyptic mm. uh, plague that wipes in the 70s. Um, but yeah, Contamination it started out as one of Dario's kind of protégés, and then he did make a couple of giallos, and he ended up making, oh, I can't remember the name of it, Pangiani Horror, I think it's called, with Donald Pleasance, which is absolutely terrible. He's very much one of those directors who only made kind of B-schluck, um, which for some people that's actually better than good stuff, let's be honest. Some people like the schlock more than they like good stuff. Um, but, you know, there's so many people that just love good, bad movies, whereas to me, I'd rather just watch good movies. I mean, if a bad movie's good, by default, it must be good. Yeah, um, but, but know, it's definitely but trashy. It's definitely a trashy yeah. movie, and this soundtrack's very. What I like about it, it's very synthy. A lot of organ, yeah. um, a lot of analog, moog, um, and you know they get their funk on because uh, this band Goblin, they love to get the funk out. And 
I, I, I've got this running joke about Goblin where there's there's certain scenes in, in um, movies scored by Goblin when the funk music comes out, you know that something terrible is going to happen. It's like a cue, isn't it? There's certain Goblin cues, isn't there? Yes. Um, they set you up nicely for things. Um, and they they know when to to employ motifs, um, so basically cues. Where yeah, this is like like in obviously Suspiria, probably the most obvious example when that when that theme starts to come back in as it does ten mm. times throughout the film. You know something uncanny is either happening now or about to happen. So yeah, they they know when to just punctuate things with uh, with a light motif, I think, is the correct term for it. But, um, and it's interesting because you, your choice there is an album, a soundtrack that doesn't have Maranti or Simonetti on it. No, it has Roberto Puglio um, on the guitars. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the, uh, the themes of this album is like a pulsating guitar. And mm -hmm. I think it sort of matches the pods because when you see the alien pods, they're vibrating. And um, I think it's a perfect sort of marriage of music with what you're seeing on the screen, however schlocky it is. And there's a lot of uh, kind of guitar effects, but um, um, that's the main um, sort of theme um, in this movie where, uh, you know, they're wrapping the soundtrack around. Um, there's also their, their trademarks of a lot of percussions. There's tribal percussions and bongos and um, yeah. um, Pignatelli's there. I mean, the bass, you hear it, and he's right up in the mix. Um, I haven't seen him play live, but I can imagine he'd probably play the bass like that, would he? You know, the fretboard would be yeah. up like that, would he? Yeah. Yeah, he's... Um... <laughs> A few. Uh, this is a good example of where the lineup change changes the sound quite a bit, as you mentioned. Uh, they start to do things here that that I'm not even sure the original lineup would have. It's not that they couldn't have done it. It's just I don't think they would have tried it in the first place. So we'll lose, for example, um, the uh, uh, the distinctive sound of Simonetti, and rather than than just come in and play exactly like Simonetti. Instead of employing his signature sounds, we've got uh, Moog synthesizers on here, which are very distinctive from uh, Simonetti's. He very rarely used it, as, certainly as the lead. He, he employed it sometimes minorly, but not, not in a major. Mm. There's, there's saxophone on it, which gives it a distinctive feel too. And yeah, it's got much more funky groove to a lot of the stuff on it. Slap bass. Mm -hmm. He has slap bass on it, so... Quite, quite jazzy piano playing as well, which again you don't get from Simonetti. Yeah, not a jazzy piano player. Um, but throughout that album, I, I don't know all the band uh, members who were kind of in and out at this point, but I know that the guitar, the piano playing does not sound like Simonetti's piano playing. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting example of this. This is a different Goblin, but it's still a really good Goblin. Yes. Um, and that that kind of permutates all their work, where it doesn't really. Yeah, of course, you're going to want the most iconic films from the most iconic lineup and blah blah blah. blah. But sometimes it's taken for granted that the best films must have the best soundtracks. So Suspiria and Dawn of the Dead are the two biggest films, so they're the iconic scores. But in soundtracks like like. Uh, this and like contamination, like tenebrae and blah blah blah. You you can get some of their best work, even though it's not their most iconic work. Mm. It's actually in some cases very obscure work, but it's some of the most interesting and perhaps more relevant work and more pertinent work because a lot of people might think, well, I've heard Goblin because I know those two soundtracks or three soundtracks. We don't know this Goblin. So with Goblin, you, you, you know, they had a period um, contamination and then there were, um, you had Tenembrae. That might have been mm. a bit of a, a return to form. And then beyond that, uh, Davey, is there any other soundtracks that you'd like to spotlight to our viewers that um, people well, should, you know, 
check it out. I mean, I think the um, Phenomena soundtrack has got some interesting, they're only a part of it, but it's got some interesting things on it. Um, Bruno Mattei's film, uh, Hell of the Living Dead, has got some of their stuff, which is um, mm. a decent film, um, if you like, extreme zombie films. Um, but I think the most pertinent one would be in The Church. Um, Michelle Suave's The Church was a great film um, from 1989. People should check out uh, the track they've got in that. Um, but Sleepless, Dario Argento's 2001 film, last time that the classic lineup worked together. I think people should hear that just to hear. Here's what your favourite guys from 1977-78 were doing in 2001. You know, the exact same lineup, the classic lineup, if you will. We only got them back once, even though, mm. again, the toured as independent entities, we only got them to play once together in Dario's Sleepless, which is a, a good film, not one of his best, but it's a good film with a pretty great soundtrack in Goblin or Betty. It's very different again, because, again, we've had Simonetti's away and he's, he's discovered younger people who are telling him you should incorporate metal into your music and go for more rock sound. And he brings that back into Goblin. So different experience. But, yeah, if you're willing to give it a chance, I think, I think people should, should kind of explore that. They don't have a lot of albums, so it's not that difficult to do. Absolutely. Look, Davey, I really appreciate you coming on the show. I think it's great that we're spotlighting a band that probably doesn't get enough um, recognition. I can tell you down under when they have record store day releases, Goblin records get snapped up. So there is definitely a cult following, a cult audience that really loves Goblin and a unique sort of band, unique movie soundtracks that you just don't hear anymore. Brief period before their the orchestral stuff stops and MTV starts. Goblin Kenna in this middle period are able to to kind of find a niche along with Tangerine Dream, as we mentioned, as probably the two best exponents of how to be a great band and make great albums that are also great soundtracks. Absolutely. Um, and if I can recommend, if people want to do check out one modern thing from any of the lineups, um, I can't remember which of the names. I think it's the Rebirth have got an album called, no, no, it's Simonetti. Claudio Simonetti's Goblin, and it's called The Devil Is Back from 2019. It's definitely called that. Um, so Goblin, The Devil Is Back, I think it's Simonetti's Goblin. And that's a return to their kind of 70s sound which is quite interesting. Um, whereas, again, a lot of the stuff in the middle where the, the British reunions tended to either be much more jazzy from one of the lineups, which is called Goblin Rebirth, and Simonetti's, again, tended to be more rock-oriented with a lot of metal twinge. But certainly The Devil Is Back is one that I'd recommend to people, and it's not a film score, it's an actual album. Okay, I'll definitely um, I'll check that one out. Davey, thank you um, for coming on to the show. Um, do you want to plug anything you're doing at the moment, um, you know, in well, respect of your um, your YouTube oh, channel or Sea of Trek? You know me, Peter. Um, I've, always, um, I've always got a million things to do and then nothing to actually remember to plug. Um, I recently did a, a big interview with legendary film director Alex Cox of Repo Man and Sid and Nancy fame and Walker. Um, so we, we spent two hours talking, and there's an hour of it you can watch, the other hour not suitable for broadcast. Um, so, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so that's that's already on the channel. Um, he's got a new film that's out for crowdfunding. Um, uh, Neil Young's latest album, Early Days, there's a review of that on the channel. Uh, he just announced Archives Volume 3, 17 discs, 5 Blu-rays, so I'll have to I'll have to take a month off work to review that. Um, and then, yeah, the Monsters Den every two weeks. Um, you can catch me on Sea of Tranquility um, and the occasional episode of uh, Review Crew as well, just talking about recent albums with uh, our good host, Jamie Laswell. Fantastic. Oh, well, thank you for coming on to the show. Um, folks, oh, tell you. us... Tell us what you think about Goblin, your favourite soundtracks, 
what your favorite Dario Argento movie is, Lucio Fulci. We'd like to read your comments. Um, please like and subscribe to Rock Day Dream Nation. But one thing's for sure, you'll see me and Davey doing another show sometime in 2024, talking more things rock. Cheers.